<laughs> uh, just a brief introduction. Um, see, there's a couple of names in the in the participant list that, um, that I don't know. So just to give an introduction to who we are, um, me and Bowser and uh, Marina is not here at the moment. Um, are the digital archaeology group. We're based in Leiden. And the main aim is to um, informally discuss digital methods, which we try to do using these um, these monthly meetings. Um, yeah, and today we've invited uh, Sven Ronsein. He's a master, uh, research master um, here in Leiden, and he's going to be uh, telling us um, about his research. So go ahead. OK, well, thank you very much for letting me present today. Uh, so yeah, as uh, you already know, my name is Sven Ronsein. I'm a research master at Leiden University, in which I combine Caribbean and computational archaeology. And today I will present my thesis research that I do under the supervision of Professor Corinne Hoffman, who is a professor of Caribbean archaeology here at Leiden, and uh, Dr. Louis Borg, who is now working uh, in the US at New Highlands, uh, New, Me New Mexico Highlands University. I'm also thankful uh, uh, to Professor Andrew Bevan and Dr. Mark Blake from UCL for teaching me some of the skills while I was doing uh, an Erasmus exchange program over there, uh, which was very essential for carrying out this thesis. So yeah, I will be talking about reconstructing landscapes of interaction in the first colonized area of the Americas, analyzing landscape affordances through GIS-based movement and visibility analysis in the area of the Ruta de Colón, the Northern Dominican Republic in between 8800 and 8500, uh, 1500, sorry. Uh, so yeah, today, um, a bit of the content. I will uh, discuss the late ceramic age to uh, introduce you all to the, the situation in the Caribbean at the time, because I'm not sure if everybody is familiar with this region. And then I will talk a bit about the background of the case study area, uh, my research questions, some of the theoretical concepts, the methods, and then some uh, results. And as I'm still working on my thesis, uh, it will be some preliminary results, because I'm now only to, uh, yeah, to start to discuss uh, what the results actually mean for this uh, region. So the late ceramic age in the Caribbean is a period in between 8800 and 8500. And since the first inhabitants in the Caribbean from uh, 7000, 6000 BC onwards, uh, the region, uh, region wide interaction networks between the various islands and the mainland of South and Central America were formed. In late ceramic age, the region was populated by diverse uh, ethnocultural indigenous communities, popularly known as the uh, Taino, who are um, situated on the Greater Antilles and um, the Caribs, who were more or less situated here on the Lesser Antilles. The archaeological record indicates that people, goods, plants, animals, and ideas were exchanged through these networks based on material culture, archaeobotanical, archaeozoological, archaeoosological isotope studies, and uh, recently DNA studies. Um, and these, uh, in the late ceramic age, age this, these interactions intensified. However, it's debated whether this is a result of expanding influence of hierarchical chiefdoms or casicascos from the Greater Antilles, under the, uh, which is associated with the Chicoit complex, uh, or whether this is a result of uh, exchange networks on, of non hierarchical communities, wherein each uh, community had equal opportunities. The study area entails roughly four geomorphological areas. From north to south, you have the coastal plains, the Cordillera Septentrional the Cibao Valley and the Cordillera Central. In terms of rainfall and climatic zones, this region is as diverse, ranging from arid climates with cacti vegetation in the eastern Monte Cristi area to moister climates with tropical rainforest vegetation in the Cordillera Septentrional in the western uh, Puerto Plata area. After initial explorations of the region by Dominican archaeologists in the 1980s, uh, such as Ortega, Guerrero and Velos Machola, this research was followed up by additional surveys by Dr. Uyawa Hung in between 2007 and 2012 in the Puerto Plata province, and later in the framework of the ERC Synergy Nexus 1492 project in between uh, 2013 and 2018, with, where, in which more archaeological surveys are carried out by uh, Dr. Uyawa Hung, uh, Dr. Eduardo Herrera Malatesta, and myself, and over 300 sites were registered. Also, open area excavations at the site of La, La Luparona, El Flaco, and El Carreo, under the supervision of Professor Corinne Hoffman and Professor Menno Hoogland, were carried out. 
The region shows a diverse ethnocultural context reflected in inter-community interactions through mixtures of ceramic styles. So at the bottom, you can uh, you, in, on this slide, you can see the main styles in the region. At the bottom, you have the Ostianet style from 8800 to 8900, more or less. At the, in the middle, you see the Mayakoit style from 8900 to 8500. And at the top, the Chikoit style from 8200 and 8500. The presence of a variety of seashell species at inland sites also indicate economic activities or interactions between various communities. As can be seen, there are a lot of combinations possible between the Ostenoid and Mayagoid styles and mixtures between them. And on this overview, um, all the combinations that are present in the case study area based on surface finds are shown. So here you can see um, a map with all the Ostenoid or Ostenoid influenced sites. Um, there are not that many, so uh, you can't really see some patterns. Uh, the Mayakoid influenced uh, sites, however, are more located uh, along the coast, as you can see, and very dispersed across the landscape. And the Chicoid sites um, are more located in the eastern uh, region of the case study area uh, and are also more clustered, especially here. Uh, in the Punta Rusia area, close to the coast. So there are some noticeable patterns in the site distributions. Sites with, highest, with the highest degree of stylistic co-occurrence seem to be located on the edge of two or more geomorphological areas in the landscape. Furthermore, elevation and distance to sea are important factors for settlement locations, as well as distance to rivers and, and the intervisibility of sites. Several sites clusters consisting of both larger and smaller sites have been identified in which intervisibility could have played an important role for the potential uh, control of the landscape or uh, areas where they extracted resources, as well as potential communication networks. The configuration of both smaller and larger sites uh, within these site clusters uh, could have been evidence um, of a settlement system in which various activities and social bonds were connected. And among the Mayakoid and Chikoid sites, there are some sites with mounds, as you will see on the next slide. And from the open area excavations at El Flaco and El Carrillo, these uh, um, they show that these mounds are used for diverse purposes, such as agricultural activities, cooking, the disposal and burning of trash, and also burials. In between these mounds, there are human-made plateaus on which post holes are found as ev evidence for houses, fences, and cooking sheds. So yeah, here on this map, you can see the distribution of sites with mounds that are indicated in red compared to the ones that are, uh, on which no mounds were recorded. The region became the first colonized area in the Americas, which started when Columbus established the settlement of La Isabella here um, in 1493 after he first landed um, uh, in this region during his first voyage in 1492. In the search for coal and other resources, the Spanish ex explored the inland area along what's now known as the Ruta de Colón, going down from the Isabella um, to the Cordillera Central, where they established uh, the fortress of Santo Domenico. This route was further fortified by the establishment of La Esperanza and La Magdalena. Uh, the exact location of the fortresses are not really not known, but based on the sources, you um, they are expected to be located somewhere here around the. Uh, Yucca River. And the importance of the indigenous communities in this in the initial phase of colonization should not be underestimated since indigenous guides were used for these explorations and during these explorations. Uh, and we know this from the diaries uh, from Columbus. Although little Spanish materials uh, culture was found during the surveys, the impact of the European colonization was disastrous for the indigenous communities in this region, uh, the Caribbean, and later the entire Americas, as you all might know. The, the impact of the environment was also massive um, with the introduction of European crops and animals. And within 20 years, the indigenous populations were either killed, enslaved, or converted uh, into an economic and communal system. And here you see uh, the very few Spanish materials that were found in the uh, case study area. So where does my research fit in then? So my aim is to reconstruct pre-Columbian landscapes of interaction in the area of the Ruta de Colón. The main question, what are the pre-Columbian social cultural interactions based on GIS-based movement and visibility analysis? And there's some sub-questions such as, how do the pre-Columbian mobility networks relate to the course of the reconstructed Ruta de Colón? 
what are the affordances and constraints of the landscapes and the sites regarding visibility and movement in the case of the area and what is the potential role of visibility and movement in the determination of uh, indigenous and early Spanish site locations. So for this research, I take a GIS-based total landscape approach. While traditional GIS-based least cost path and visibility analysis are based on point-to-point -point analysis, the total landscape approach incorporates a many-to-many -many point analysis, uh, which enables the possibility to evaluate the socio-ecological properties inherent in the entire landscape. Uh, I will be using a theoretical concept uh, developed by Gibson somewhere in the 1980s uh, called the affordances of landscape. And uh, this concept assumes that the environment is embedded with properties from which agents extract meaning while engaging with it and perceiving it. I take a relational approach to affordances in which affordances are the properties of the environment that come into existence through the interactions of agents with the environment. And therefore, there are a process between environmental situations and the agent's abilities, including experience and memory. Uh, therefore, they can exist independently of potential perceivers, and these affordances can also be mapped in studies. So affordances are relational in this way because they can be partly directly perceived and partly learned. The methods that I will be using and will be uh, discussing today are the from everywhere to everywhere analysis and visibility analysis, in which I will discuss the view shed size analysis, uh, the visual neighborhood configurations, and accumulated view sheds. So least cost path analysis, uh, they calculate uh, a path of least resistance between two or multiple points based on the cost surface model. However, there are some problems in traditional least cost path analysis. Um, first, they do not really show any alternative routes because they're only, they will only show a route between A to B. Um, the paths become less accurate over longer distances. Uh, if you use uh, one origin point and multiple destination point, that will result in a radiating pattern. And um, yeah, if you use archaeological sites as origin and destination point, that could be a huge issue surrounding contemporaneity. So what would be the alternative? I think uh, an from everywhere to everywhere approach or an accumulated least cost path analysis is a very good alternative. Um, so an FET is an automated least cost path procedure that accumulates least cost paths. And for my thesis, I wrote the script in Python uh, using the grass air walk function inspired by uh, White and Barbers and Philip Verhagen's approach. Um, so how does this uh, work? You take a grid on top of a landscape and there you combine, uh, and there you calculate the least cost path between each combination of points in this grid. And then you end up with a path frequency raster in which um, the path frequency to through every cell is, uh, is mapped. So why a, an FET approach then? I think there, the benefits are that I take into account alternative pathways. Uh, the analysis are not per se site dependent and it allows you to study the movement potential of an entire landscape. Furthermore, they can also be eventually converted into a network representation and analyzed by network statistics. The drawbacks, however, is that are quite computationally demanding and that I still deal with some of the shortcomings of traditional least cost path analysis, such as the assumption that the traveler has knowledge of the entire landscape. So before discussing the feasibility analysis, I will discuss some terms to make sure we are on the same page. Um, the few, a few shed is uh, all the visible, visible cells from a certain uh, viewpoint based on the DAM represented in binary values. Accumulated few sheds is then an accumulation of few sheds from multiple viewpoints, and a total few shed is an accumulation of uh, few sheds from every cell in a DAM. So, for the few shed analysis, I start with uh, evaluating the few shed size from sites compared to uh, random sampled points. Uh, and through this kind of Monte Carlo simulated approach, it's possible to evaluate whether few shed sizes of sites are uh, significantly different than those of random points. And if th that's the case, you can ask whether uh, this is an intentional process. The visual neighborhood configurations, uh, which I will be using, is a method uh, for which you use total few sheds. Uh, but total few sheds only take into account the visual properties of specific points in the landscape. 
However, people do not often observe from one location, so you're more interested in how specific points are embedded within their surrounding area. So a few, uh, visual neighborhood, neighborhood configuration approach makes it possible to evaluate the visual properties of a focal location in relation to its neighborhood. How does this work? So you take a um, total view shot in which you have the visual property, uh, properties of an entire of, of the landscape or the region that you're working with. And then you determine a neighborhood um, and then um, the algorithm calculates um, a statistical uh, measure for uh, each neighborhood in the entire landscape and then you end up with a raster map in which the bad fit uh, and good fit to certain hypotheses are shown. For my uh, thesis, I will use the following metrics. So I will use the average visibility, the visual prominence, and I also want to test some visual hypothesis because with a VNC, it's also possible to um, to compare the views to and views from total view sheds. So for instance, if, you're, if your hypothesis could be uh, that sites are hidden, uh, more hidden uh, at the location itself. So the location itself has low uh, views too, but near the sites, there are um, locations where you have a very high views from, so a very good view. Um, yeah, you can uh, determine these locations in the landscape um, they, with, the, with the help of this, uh, this method. Uh, and that would be interesting, for instance, if you're looking for hunting sites. Uh, So some preliminary results um, done. So first I will uh, discuss the FET output. Um, yeah, uh, to further uh, uh, stress the difference is why a grid is useful using an FET approach instead of the sites, I calculated an FET based on sites. And the FET based on sites shows that uh, uh, it's really needed to use a regular grid to fully, fully realize the full potential of the FRA to FRA analysis. As a result of recovery biases, the pots are not covering the full extent of the case study area. As you can see, the eastern region is completely untouched. As it improves on radiating patterns and showing alternative routes compared to traditional least cost path analysis, the pots are still very unrealistic over longer distances since they are directly connected in between sites, which is problematic when it comes to, again, the contemporaneity of the origin and destination points. The grid-based FET analysis shows the pots more realistically since they, calculate, since they are calculated on smaller five by five interval points, uh, kilometer interval points uh, in the grid. And uh, it also expresses the movement potential in, of the entire landscape better uh, since the entire case study area is covered. So for instance, the corridors of movement along the Yucca River here from uh, east to west or west to east are uh, much better expressed in this output. So what are the major corridors of movement in this region? The highest pulse frequencies are located along the coast, especially near the Punta Gucia area, which is here. And the second largest concentration of pulse frequencies are located in the Cibao Valley along the uh, Yucca River, so here. And visually, uh, it seems that the sites are located, oh, that the pots are located in close vicinity of the archaeological sites. So if you look at the sites then, to further understand the variety of pot frequency values near sites, I calculated the maximum and most values at various neighborhoods uh, and also the mean values around the sites. By subtracting the mode from the max, you can determine uh, what sites have more standardized access to pot frequencies and what sites are more diverse uh, in terms of uh, the pot frequency values in the neighborhood. And so that you can see on the middle map here, you can see the max uh, values of a neighborhood of 500 meters. Um, here you have the max mode ratio of 500 meters and here you have the mean metric, which is uh, a metric that uh, is derived from multiplying the max mode ratio uh, by the mean, uh, which allows you to further uh, uh, disentangle what sites are standardized um, 
as a result of divergent values across the neighborhood or as a result of tight clusters of frequency values across the neighborhoods. So the few shed size analysis. But on the left, you can see uh, the sites and random points that was used to compare the distribution of the few shed sizes of sites and random points in the area. And on the left, there is an ECDF graph showing that the distribution of the few shed sizes of sites is significantly different with a p-value of uh, 0 0.05 um, than the few shed sizes of random points. So across the distribution, sites have a larger few sheds than random points. And that's interesting because then you can really think whether um, uh, sites were located at locations with good uh, visibility uh, properties. So the visual neighborhood configuration, I will only show the uh, visual neighborhood configuration with a neighborhood of 250, 40 meters uh, in which the average visibility is expressed. And as you can see on the um, eastern uh, area of the region, there are very high uh, or like good visual properties. And in the western area, there are more like low facial properties. And this is also because of the topography, of course. But as you can see, uh, when you look at the sites, um, a lot of sites are located on top of um, of these green areas, or uh, even in the West, they are located uh, near uh, local green areas where they have good facial um, properties. So again, it seems that sites are uh, located at locations uh, in, in which few can, can make a difference. So in terms of the cumulative few sheds, and um, I, I only uh, started uh, processing this result this week, so I'm not really, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't really, I, I couldn't really discuss all the patterns uh, yet. But uh, just to show you some examples, so in line with uh, Ulloa Hunes and Eduardo Herrera Malatesta's dissertation, the uh, Mayakoit sites are more dispersed across the case study area, which might relate to their earlier to the early arrival of those groups. As Ulloa Hume noted in, in his field uh, observations, the Mayakoit sites seem to have more fragmented fuel sheds that are more sea-oriented. And uh, he related that to the control of the extraction of marine resources. This uh, few shed seems to confirm that pattern though. Um, in addition to the intervisibility of Mayakoit sites and few, uh, uh, the, the intervisibility of Mayakoit sites and the fuse to Chicoit sites is also weaker from the Mayakoit sites, if that makes sense, that you can see here on the right. Um, so the Chicoit sites, seem to form a specific cluster in this region, mostly here near the Punta Gusi area. According to uh, Ulloa's home observations again, the Chicoit sites share a strong intervisibility. Uh, there are more Chicoit sites visible from Chicoit sites compared to uh, Mayakoit sites that are uh, visible from Chicoit sites. Uh, and this, this is also evident from the fuel sheds. Another interesting note is that the uh, Chicoid few sheds uh, target very specific areas at sea, as you can see here. Um, and this could be related to Uyoa's whom he hypothesis that uh, Chicoid sites do not have direct access to sea resources compared to Mayakoid sites as a result of their potential later revival of the Chicoid groups in this region. So if there is some form of comp competing over limited space and resources, um, it could have been important uh, for those groups to have a strong official control over these, um, yeah, over these uh, areas. So if you put that all on the table, uh, as already mentioned, the Chicoid sites have a much stronger number of interfacial, intervisible sites at the same ceramics, of the same ceramic style, excluding sites that are only touch ones and uh, the, then the Mayakoid style the sites. Um, and also from the Chicoid sites, the visible sites uh, with Mayakoid ceramic or multiple component ceramic styles are higher than from the Mayakoid sites, as you can see here. So there are more Chicoid sites. So Chicoid sites see, tend to see Chicoid sites more than Mayakoid sites. And also the multi-component uh, sites 
and the Mayakoid sites, they yeah, they don't really have a very strong indivisibility uh, between the two. And um, but they, the Mayakoid sites have more views on the Chicoid sites compared to their own group, and um, not that many uh, views as well regarding the multi-component uh, ceramic sites. Adding the dimension of the pathways in the region, the visual control of paths um, could have been important. Could have been an important factor for both the Mayakoid and Chicoid sites. Perhaps even more important than the views on areas with marine resources. Mayakoid sites seems to have a scattered view on the major paths in the coastal region. However, the highest frequencies, uh, path frequencies, seems to correspond to the highest visibility indices in the region, as you can see here. So, um, yeah. It also seems just visually from the map that um, uh, important nodes of paths are um, more visible from these sites. The Chicoid site seems to have a much stronger visual control of the coastal area. As you can see here, all locations are mostly touched at least uh, twice. And um, they also have a strong view on this area with high path frequencies. So some preliminary conclusions so far. Um, the major corridors of movement seem to predominantly east-west orientated instead of north-south. And that also makes sense because that's also the major drainage, uh, the, the drainage of most rivers also going east-west. But um, conceptually, um, uh, archaeologists in this region were mostly thinking north-south, also because of their reconstructed Route de la Colonne version, which I will discuss uh, in a bit. The major and minor corridors of movements and their intersections seems to be important for the determination of site locations. However, this should be further explored statistically. In the central uh, coastal area of the region, it seems that sites are located further away from the major corridors. However, they are also th this is the region with the highest visual properties or the best visual properties. The excavated sites of El Flaco and El Carril seems to be located near important pathways that cross the Cordilleras at Tentua now. And that's interesting because this is also, um, these sites are also uh, hypothesized to be located close to the Ruta de Colón that passes uh, in this region. And the reconstruction of the Ruta de Colón by Ortega in 1988, of which it's not extremely um, clear how uh, he came to this reconstruction, mostly based on fake descriptions in the Spanish uh, chronicler, chronicles. Um, this uh, Ruta de Colón uh, seems not to be corresponding with the major corridors of movement in the region. So either the reconstruction is not very accurate or uh, the Spanish uh, could have uh, used uh, yeah, pots that are not very high in pot frequency. There's a big difference, however, in the visual properties between the east and the west of the case study area, as you could see from the VNC results. And the site seems to be located at or nearby areas with high visual properties, and the pots seem to do that as well. And there are some um, differences uh, noticeable in terms of the cumulative view sheds of Mayakoid and Chicoid sites. However, I still need to uh, look into more of the literature and see whether that could be a result of different uh, strategies, for instance, for the extraction of resources, or whether that uh, has to do with the, the Casicascos that are hypothesized to be present in this region. And lastly, the coastal area with high pot frequencies is also most visible from both the Mayakoid and Chicoid sites. So yeah. Um, please, if you have any questions, um, Go ahead.